So I'm so afraid of failing that I had to do as I was told. And so when Adina said, you make a failure resume, I was like, yes, ma'am. I'm making a failure resume, I'm not failing at this. <laughs> so I went chronologically and I thought about, you know, when I look back, um, what were some of the, the big deal failures? Um, and the first one was uh, in fourth grade, I lost the fourth grade chess championship. <laughs> and I'm serious about that. Like it was a fourth, fifth class. It was like 22 kids in the class, 11 were in fourth grade. Eight of them didn't know how to play chess. So there were three of us that did, and I didn't win. And it was a big deal, because this was the first time in my life I was in a situation that was really supposed to be competitive. And I was like, oh yeah, those other eight kids don't even know how to play. I got this. But no, and it was a big deal. And so I was heartbroken, and life goes on, and went on to high school, and. First, one of the first class I'd taken high school was an acting class, because evidently I have difficulty talking in front of people, which is why I'm a professor now. Um, and, then, and I got a D in the acting class. And I was like, wow, this is really kind of uh, bad, because there's this thing called college I'd like to go to, and they probably don't appreciate letters like this in the alphabet. <laughs> and it was a big deal because it created all kinds of uncertainty about what I thought I could do and what it meant that I might be able to do afterwards. Um, but then, miraculously, somehow I you know, ended up here in college and the first class I was in was, they still have, was called Freshman English at the time, now it's power for those of you who are going through it, and I got my first paper, and I got a C. And you know, this was like after, you know, doing better in high school or there were some good grades to get in here. And I was like, wow, I thought I could write, but evidently I can't because I was of that ilk, too, that a C is, is a failing grade. Like, no one told me that, you know, F is actually a failing grade. And at Stanford, we didn't even have Fs then, but it was a C. And so this was this reflection on my character. And I thought, oh, well, if I want to do something afterwards, like graduate school or something like that, well, that's not going to be a possibility. And, and this is a big deal. And uh, I went to graduate school. And one of the things right before graduate school was I applied for this big pr prestigious fellowship and got an interview for the fellowship. And went to the interview. It was up in San Francisco at this hotel. And uh, go into this room, and this person starts asking me these questions. And at one point, while I'm trying to solve the problem, he just looks at me and he said, did they teach you to do that at Stanford? Like, <laughs> Do you just like crapped all over this piece of paper? Like, what the hell is that? What kind of like second rate school are you going to? And like, that was a reflection on me because I couldn't solve the problem and I didn't get the fellowship. And that kind of sucked because it sort of meant, well, what does this mean for graduate school? Um, but went to graduate school. During, during graduate school, I won't belabor all the things that happened, but uh, you know, there were a bunch of papers that got rejected at various places, um, which was always kind of fun. But, managed to graduate from graduate school and went out on the job market and thought I wanted to be an academic and there were two places I applied to that were really interesting that I wanted to go to and one of them was MIT and went there for an interview met a bunch of interesting people it was a lovely experience there were some faculty there who were just amazing wonderful students I will probably never admit this again especially not at MIT and uh, <laughs> interview happens I'm like oh this is wonderful stay in touch with some people there and uh, get a call from the department chair a couple months later and said, thanks for interviewing, but you're not the candidate we're recommending. And I was like, wow, that, that also sucks, right? Because I spent all this time going to graduate school because I wanted to be a professor. And one of the other places I applied to at the time um, was a research lab in Pittsburgh called Just Research, which was kind of a fun name. It was actually funded by a company in Japan called Just Systems. And I used to think of it as just, like justice, right? So you can convince yourself of anything. Um, <laughs> but went out there for an interview, wonderful group of people, uh, made some actually amazing friends there, some people that I'm still friends with now from this interview in Pittsburgh 20 odd years ago. And uh, wonderful place, really liked it. I was like, oh, I would love to be here, a great place to do research, wonderful <coughs> colleagues. Um, a couple weeks later, got a call from them saying, you know, thanks for interviewing. It was nice to have you here, but we can't hire you. And I was, all right, well, you know, we, we got through all these hoops to get to graduate school, and like, you know, now we're at this place, it's like, you know, what's going on? Um, one of the other things that happened at the time, which was not, you know, there's all these kind of academic failures. One of the things sometimes we feel a little more ashamed to talk about are personal failures. 
Um, and one of the things that happened when I was in graduate school was I got engaged to someone. So we've been dating for two years, then we got engaged, and uh, we have like another two years of engagement, and we're planning a big wedding, right? So hundreds of people, the whole like big spiel. Luckily, we had not sent out invitations because four months prior to the wedding, when we were just about to send out invitations, we called the engagement off and broke up. And that also sucked, right? So there was just this, this <laughs> level of, for lack of a better word, suckage. That was <laughs> um, Good word. Yeah. <laughs> Suckage.com, I'm taking that. No one else take that. Um, and uh, it was a really, honestly, it was a dark time. It's probably the, I'd probably say the worst time in my life. Because you look at all these things that were reflections of what you wanted to do, the things you thought you'd accomplished at that point, what you thought about yourself as a person, what other people thought about you as a person, and all these things just start like falling apart. So you're like, well, what am I gonna do? Gotta go get a job somewhere, right? There was a friend of mine who was actually, said, we're doing the startup, why don't you come check it out? I'm there, it's okay. Um, Went to spend some time in the industrial world for a while. And one of the things that, that happened along the way that was interesting was uh, when I was trying to make these decisions, there was a friend of mine who said, you know, because I was all like, what am I going to do? What job am I going to take? And he said, you know why this seems like a big deal? I said, because it is a big deal. And he said, no. It's because you haven't had all the other experiences yet to understand that this is just one step in this process. And I was like, what does that mean? What that means is it was fourth grade. It was the chess championship all over again. And it was the context that I was in, which was, this is where I've gotten to so far, and at this point, I'm facing a failure. What does that mean? Well, what it means is you have a choice. Like, what is this going to mean to you a year from now, five years from now, ten years from now? I look back on those things now, and I'm like, they're kind of funny. They're like the, you know, they're the story I give you now is the slightly more serious version. When I talk to students about it, there's a slightly more humorous version of some of the things that happened, right? There, were, there was a job interview I could tell you about where I drove out. This was on the East Bay. A friend of mine worked at this company. It was this, you know, interesting place back in 1992. Drive out there. The interview's at uh, 8 a.m., Right, it was not a good time for an interview for computer science people, the computer science people. <laughs> so I was, of course, pulling an all-nighter the night before working on some project, and so it's like 6 a.m. I'm like, well, let me just drive out there now. I'll beat traffic, right? So I drive out there, 7 a.m., get to this place in the East Bay, and the interview's in an hour. So I'm in the car. It's a nice, warm, cushion. <laughs> okay, so I'm like, well, I'll just hang out. I'll put the seat back a little bit. <laughs> Next thing I know, my head's jerking up, it's 9.15. No. I run out over to the interview, I'm here all disheveled. I have an interview here at 8 o'clock, I'm really sorry I'm late. They're like, eh, they're not happy, but they're like, okay, you can go on with the interview. So I'm in this totally sleep deprived, just woke up state, and I hear someone telling me, you have to take this test, and you have to actually write this program, and I hear the word hour and a half which is actually not one word, but I hear it is hour and a half. <laughs> and so they put me in this room, they gave me this test. I'm sitting here filling out this test, and then there was a computer, and they're like, this is this thing you're supposed to program. They gave me this sheet of stuff you're supposed to program. So I'm sitting there writing, I'm just writing, I'm like, this is ridiculous, all this time is passing. And so I crank this thing out, and I, and I come running out of the room at the hour and a half mark, and I'm like, okay, I think I'm done, here it is. And they give me this really weird look, like, why are you coming out? Cause, Cause I'm done, and they said you're done. I'm like yeah, I'm done. And so I give them this thing, and they give me this weird look, and they take it away. And uh, what I hadn't realized in my sleep deprived state was they said you have an hour and a half for the test, and you have an hour and a half for the program. <laughs> I thought I had an hour and a half for the whole thing. So I do a crappy job on all this stuff. Give them the thing. They think of me as like this guy showed up an hour and fifteen minutes late for the interview, <laughs> and now he's not taking this thing seriously, even though he's here. And the friend of mine who set up the interview with the company comes over and he's like, let's go to lunch. <laughs> so we go to lunch, we come back, turns out there's a couple other people I meet, which turns out there's fewer than the people I was supposed to meet, because they'd already decided I was not getting hired. So, didn't get that job, but learned an important lesson about not pulling it all night the night before. Um, but even despite that, 
what ended up happening was there were some other jobs that happened along the way, which happened through sort of some interesting times and, and knowing some uh, people. And that's one of the things about Stanford that I, I really appreciate. And like Ray said, the fact that you're here actually already makes a huge difference, right? The fact that whether or not you're a student here or a faculty member or staff member or just someone in the community, because the connection of people here is amazing. And so one of the people who, when I was, you know, went to this first job was someone who was a contact from here, someone I actually did projects with when I was in grad school. He said, come check out the startup. And I went to the startup. Turned out it worked out pretty well. And then I was going to leave to come back here to teach. And this other friend said, you know, come check out this other thing we're doing. Went there and turned out that friend's name was Sergey Brin. Turned out he was a pretty good person to know. <laughs> but it happened because of this place. It happened because a whole bunch of people who their plans are to try to make an impact in the world, at least I like to think that, all get brought into physical proximity and people say go. Like learn what you can learn, do what you can do, show us what you can do here and do it together. And you have that here, you have that when you leave. Part of all these things that happen along the way is you realize that all failure does is it, it sort of heightens your sense of uncertainty, right? You have the sense of like what you want to do and who you are and what you're trying to accomplish. And when someone says no or some door is closed to you, suddenly that creates uncertainty about what you think you can do, what you think you can accomplish and, and your view of yourself. I think part of the, the thing that, that made a difference to me is I'm not different as a person. I wasn't different as a person in fourth grade before or after the chess championship. I wasn't a different person before or after the grant got rejected or approved. But my feelings about my worth as a person were different, even though as a person I really wasn't any different. And that's the thing, I think, in terms of the, the big takeaway from all of it is, is realizing that uh, there's... A lot of it's just expectations you have for yourself and other people's expectations of you. And you can't let those influence what you really want to do. All along the way, after all these failures, the biggest thing that happened was every time I was making a decision, there was this whole series of decisions where like, everyone else around me basically said, like, what are you doing? That's the wrong thing to do. And, I, and, and it's hard when like, everyone around you is telling you it's the wrong thing to do. To be honest, when I was at Google and I was coming here, there was a steady stream of people leaving academia, going to Google. And at my going away party there, like half the people in the room were former professors. <laughs> and every one of them wanted to take me aside at some point and say, like, what are you doing? <laughs> and like by the third one, you're like, no, really, it's okay. I think I know what I'm doing. Right? But it's hard because you're trying to match your expectations every what everyone else wants to think of you. Um, but I think the thing in the end that really made a big difference to me is like, as long as you're still believing like what matters to you, right, and you make the decisions that matter to you, and even in spite of those failures, like you will do the thing that's right for you, you will do the thing that makes you happy. Um, and just to follow up on Ray's, Ray's point, one final thing, after going through all this stuff with like the grades and the, the chess championship was still, still works now. <laughs> <laughs> the whole point of telling you that was it, it seems ridiculous now, right? All those other things pretty much are ridiculous, right? Because they don't matter anymore. All that matters is kind of where you got. Um, but my kids actually go to a school in Palo Alto, if anyone of you know Ohlone, it has no grades. Because I don't want them to have to deal with that same kind of situation. And they love it. So that's my story.